practical application. This is the FFT code that I used for the demo last time, right? And what we have is essentially, you know, hopefully you are already familiar with uh, this. I think I uploaded it onto the Moodle also, so please take a look. We will make sure that it is there for you to look at. The way that the FFT has been written is just following exactly the principle of, you know, either the decimation on time or decimation on frequency. I am not sure which, but one of those techniques, right? The standard five stage five stages of butterflies, right? Five five stages because this is a 32 point FFT. For your 1K FFT, it would be 10 stages, right? And the way that we do it is we do the bit reversal in the beginning, not at the end. It does not matter, that can be swapped around, it will give you the same result. You will see that, you know, the variables have been declared as static over here. That is something that is related to the way that Vivado HLS works. It interprets static variables as block RAMs, which will retain their value from one call of the function or one invocation of this module to the next. Okay. If you declare a simple variable static integer, it will essentially create a register. If you declare a static array, it will create a RAM, a block memory. Okay, which if it is very small, it might still treat it as registers, but chances are it will actually make it a uh, block memory. So, this is what the code looks like. I am not going to look at the test bench and so on. You are already familiar with that. Let us straight away look at what happens if I just synthesize this. Okay, So, before we synthesize, let us look at the right side over here. Right, You see this tab called directives. Right, Directives is where I can give instructions to the compiler or give directives, I mean the, that is the best word for it actually, right. I mean it is not really an instruction, it is more like a suggestion to the compiler saying do this. There is a chance that the compiler will ignore your directive saying that you know this cannot be implemented in a certain way. Most likely or almost certainly you will get a warning if that is the case, right. But otherwise what is happening is these directives are used to tell the compiler that it can try certain kinds of optimizations for example, unrolling, pipelining and so on, which are normally considered unsafe for a compiler to do. Okay. So, all of those optimizations that we talked about, see certain things like common sub expression elimination and all, the compiler will just do, because those are very obvious and simple and you know reasonably straightforward. There may be cases where it is not able to catch a common sub expression and gets, you know, does not do it properly. You will usually be able to tell by looking at the synthesis results and you can then fix that, right. So, these directives are usually used at a slightly higher level, things that a compiler would not normally do. Okay. Let us look at examples. So, before we get into that, first thing we do is we just take this baseline code, let us synthesize it. Okay. So, what happens when I just synthesize this basic HLS code, hopefully it runs properly, yeah. So, by the way, one other thing, you will notice that the time taken for synthesis over here was 15 seconds right, this is a 32 point FFT, right. If it is a 1K FFT, it will be pretty much similar, uh, less than a minute for sure, okay. If your synthesis is taking more than one minute, right, it probably means that there is some problem with the way you have written the code. The compiler is getting confused with something that you have written and is trying to do something which will cause problems for you later on, okay. Go back, look at your code and fix that problem. Right, because we actually have instances of a design that has like 9 FF, no, I think 13 FFT blocks, matrix multiplication, cordic, everything in it synthesizing in one and a half minutes, okay, less than in around 100 seconds or so, right. So, depending on how you write the code, it is entirely possible to get fast synthesis. The problem is there are certain kinds of ways of writing the code that can result in terrible performance also. So, you have to be careful of that. Okay, so, now what do we see here? Again, the main thing to look at is 1600 cycles latency and 1600 cycles initiation interval, right? Because essentially, if you go look at, you know, this analysis pane that is put over here, it pretty much tells you exactly what is happening. There is a bit reversal which takes some number of steps, right? If you look at this, you will notice that according to this, everything should be over within 12 steps. Right, but it is taking 1600. So, obviously, a step over here is does not correspond, uh, correspond to one clock cycle. A step is a so called control step, when a particular operation could be initiated or terminated. Right? And if you go deeper into it, you will find that each of those steps in turn has an elaborate 
explanation of how many cycles or how many steps it is going to take. How many, uh, yeah, in turn, it breaks it up. But the important point from that diagram is that everything is just completely serial over there. Okay. So, if you look at it, synthesis option 1600 cycles. Let us look at what happens over here. There are two parts to the latency. One is, it says that the FFT module takes 305 clock cycles and there is also a separate bit reversal loop which takes 96 clock cycles. This is already interesting because if I really look at it, the bit reversal according to the way that I wrote the code, the bit reversal is also a function. Okay? But if you go and look at the results over here, right, at the bottom that I am showing you over there, you will find that there is one, there are a few things over here. The important point is inlining function bit reverse into FFT, an example of function inlining. Okay. Why? If you look at the code, the bit reverse function is simple, it is just a for loop. Okay. And what the system has decided is, this is not software, I am not going to be scheduling instructions, but on the other hand, if it was a separate function, I would have to create a finite state machine, give it a start signal, wait for a done signal, etc. Instead, I can just use those states, incorporate those states into my main system state machine and reduce the complexity a little bit. Okay. Bit reverse is a simple enough function, it inlines it. FFT is not, FFT0 is not simple enough for it to do that, it treats it as a separate module which is why in the synthesis result, we see that that is treated as an instance, whereas bit reversal is treated as a loop. Okay. All right, so bit reversal is taking 96 clock cycles. Let us understand that it has a trip count of 32, meaning that the for loop is actually running 32 times. We know that because that is how we wrote the code and the latency is 3 cycles. What is happening inside bit reversal? I need to compute this index, I need to read a value from index and I need to write a value into data out, exactly what I showed you earlier. Right? There is a compute, read and write. The order is different, it is not read, compute, write, it is compute, read, write. Okay? Can I pipeline it? All right, let us try it. The way that you do it is you basically right click on this, insert a directive. Okay? There are two options, you can either put it into the directive file. What that means is it creates a separate script that captures your directives right? and allows you to have separate scripts with uh, separate sets of directives that you can try out on the same hardware. Okay? The alternative is to put it in the source file. Okay? What you need to do is pick the pipeline directive. I am going to put it in the source file just to show you what it looks like, but in general you can put it in the directive file as well, it does not really matter too much. So, if I put it in the source file, what it does is it just adds something called a hash pragma. Okay? Hash pragma is not a standard C, C++ code. On the other hand, or rather it is something that is standard in C, C++, it is a way by which you can pass directives to the compiler. In this case, the hash pragma is used in order to pass HLS directives. Okay? So, what you see over here is it says pragma space HLS, so it tells it in which area or which namespace the directive is that you are trying to give and then the actual pipeline itself which is the directive. What happens when you do this? I need to save the file and synthesize it again. What will happen when I do that is it will then go through the same process. right? Typically what happens during the synthesis is that you will find analyzing the design and then starting code transformations are two places where it might sometimes get stuck for a while. right? That analyzing the design is bit interesting basically what is happening is if you have multiple files unfortunately it ends up being slow it actually takes a long time to read through multiple files if you put everything into a single file it sometimes works faster code transformations is a place where sometimes you can get stuck really badly because especially if you have large arrays that are declared somewhere the compiler can get really confused about what to do with them all right let's look at what impact that change had 1630 has now become 1569. Good. What was the change that it made? The bit reversal loop is now a trip count of 32, is pipelined and now has an initiation interval. The target was 1 and it achieved 1. So, that is good and it has an iteration latency of 3. 
therefore the total latency of the system is still 33 it is not just 32 why the prologue and epilogue. So, the iteration latency is still 3 cycles you add all of that together it takes 31 cycles in the loop body plus 2 cycles prologue and epilogue okay, to complete it. So, it is able to finish the entire thing within 33 cycles as opposed to 96 and that was what resulted in 1500 coming down to uh, 1600 coming down to 1500 and something. Okay. Good let us see if we can do the same thing for the FFT also right this FFT 0 also has a loop inside it. What happens if I apply a directive there right I will just give it a pipeline directive it does not matter whether it is in the source file or not. What happens when I synthesize that is you will find that the functions inside the FFT block right what are they there are a lot of things happening over here there is some computation of index let us just quickly take a look at it then there is some other additions being done over here the main work is in this product right and then a plus and minus of that product followed by an if statement if you really look at it all of them could potential a lot of these things could potentially either be done in parallel or at the very least could benefit from pipelining. I can do the expression corresponding to cycle i in uh, or rather you know the dependency for i can be done in the previous iteration and so on. What happens to the synthesis result? It has now come down to 300 cycles. What happened right let us look at the instances the FFT latency has essentially come down to 51 from 305 it came down to 51. Okay. If I go inside it I will find that that 51 essentially corresponds to the actually that is interesting let us just take a look at that right what is happening over here is in inside the FFT there are no further instances, but there is a loop which runs 16 times it has a target initiation interval of 1, but it achieved only 2. Okay. Why is that if you look at it what is happening is there are 2 writes to data out that are happening over here there is data out getting updated here as well as over here. Okay. And the way that we have written the code at least the data in and data out even though they are separate variables at the top level as far as this function is concerned it is just treating them as a single array a memory block. So, it is trying to write two values to it it says that it cannot do them in a single cycle and therefore, it is splitting it out over two cycles right and you end up with this achieved initiation interval of two and it has a huge iteration latency. What does that mean an iteration latency of 20 basically means that in order to do all of these steps which is you know compute this then do the addition then do the computing the L limit this product is a complex floating point computation that takes up a large part of the latency. Okay. Then you have also complex floating point additions which are also not single cycle latency they take a little bit more than that net result we have. 49 cycles latency for the FFT block plus handshaking one cycle to start one cycle to stop. So, it becomes 51 by the time it reaches the top level 51 into 5 is somewhere around 250 something plus 33 for the bit reversal we end up with 299. Okay. Last optimization look at how the code over here is written right it looks very similar to this right there are three functions a b c being called over here over there there are five functions f 50 0 f 50 0 f 50 0. If you look at the way that the code has been written it has been written in such a way that the input going into the first function writes into another variable which then goes as input to the next function. So, the dependencies have actually been split across five variables right I am not overwriting the same variable again. Right. What happens if I now add a data flow directive to this function? What does data flow mean? That is software pipelining. Okay. So, at the function level, data flow is essentially software pipelining that you apply over here, right? You have to be very careful with this. For data flow to work, you will find that when you try using it on any function of yours, it will there is a good chance that it will complain saying that it cannot do it. 
right? Or it will complain that the order of in which you read some variable or you wrote some variable or you did something else is not correct. It can't handle this. It will keep complaining about it. That's because you need to basically understand that as far as data flow blocks are concerned, in addition to the fact that the dependency should only be in one direction going forward, it also makes an assumption that you are only going to take certain values in order and transfer them. What happened? We have come down to 36 clock cycles. Okay. So, from 1600 initiation interval, we have come down to 36. Okay. And the latency over here is 169. Right. So, you actually see what is happening is that in this case, the FFT latency instead of 51 actually came down to 33. Right. If you look at what happened over there, you will actually you go inside and you will find that now because you have explicitly made it clear even at the top level that the data out signal is going to be something different for each block. It is able to parallelize both the data writes and use a dual port RAM in order to achieve the fact that both the data outs can be written during a same clock cycle. Okay. Which means that the latency of the FFT block itself comes down to 33 which means that the total latency of the system is 33 into 5, right? which uh, 33 into 5 plus something it should be, Okay, I am not sure uh, about this 169, we will probably have to look at that and find out where that 169 came from. But you can see that the interval at least is just one cycle greater than the max of the others. right? The bit reversal in this case takes 35 cycles and that ends up being the block B over here, the one with the largest latency okay? and the bottleneck which sets the initiation interval of the overall system. All good except for one catch, right? This has basically, what about the hardware usage, right? So, what I am going to do is let me just very quickly just get rid of these uh, directives and go back to the original so that we can do a comparison, right? So, you can see that basically I was able to bring down the latency or the initiation interval from 1600 to 33, 36 the total latency from 1600 to 170 or so, right. What is the net result? Let us just do a side by side comparison. What we do is we can do project compare reports. I have already synthesized the other two with the optimizations. The all opt is the one with 299 latency without data flow. Okay. And what you can see is over here, the clock is met comfortably in all cases. The latency 1600, 299, 169, initiation interval 1600, 299, 36. Okay. Now, what about the utilization estimates? With no optimizations, it basically takes 10 block RAMs. With everything except data flow, it takes 22. With data flow, it takes 40. You need block RAMs between every stage. Okay. The number of DSP slices, no optimization, everything is being done serially. So, effectively you end up with the fact that you know one floating point multiplication takes four DSP slices. You can do the approximate analysis over here. It takes 20 in the case of no optimization. Surprisingly, in all optimization it has come down to less. Data flow on the other hand has gone up significantly because now you need to actually do things in parallel. Okay. Similarly, for the hardware, the flip flops and lookup tables between no opt and DF opt, there is a nearly, well, 5x, 5 to 10x increase can be seen. In this case, 5x basically, right? And that sort of makes sense because what you are saying is instead of one hardware unit, I now have five of them. 